Good evening. Welcome to the Election Late Show. Only two weeks to go now. Try to stay calm. You ready, boys? Ready, Nige. Nice dress. <laughs> Shoes? You could have those. I could, couldn't I? Yes. Yeah. Mm. What would journos do without politicians to put us right? I'd come, 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 come. come. News flash. It's Mr. Major who had 16 bastards. 16? Not 16 bastards, but 60. This is a recipe for mayhem. You're telling me, John, get a load of this millimania. <laughs> I think One Direction have nothing to worry about. Are you sure about that, Ed? Cheeky. Another. A C or a G? It's a C, but the way that... The... Maybe I'll just say Clyde. <laughs> now, if there's one thing I hate, it's a bad door frame. Yeah, this looks like a pretty good door frame. Yeah, yeah. Phew. Anyone know what the other Ed can do really well? I can do a very good duck, buddy. Speaking of well-hidden talents... Tony used to do that sort of thing much better. Try again, Andrew. Try again, Allegra. Cymru. 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 C-U-M. Yeah, C-U-M, yeah. yeah. OK, all right. Cymru. Hold on. Serious question now. Do you think the aliens did bring the underpants? Yes, Boris. I do. Existential question. <laughs> Cymru. Cymru. Yeah, you got it. Every Friday night until the election, we're bringing you our perverse and wonkish analysis of the week's campaigning. With the help of unfeasibly cheap technology, the odd exhausted politician, a smattering of commentators, and what every political programme on the planet still insists on calling ordinary people. We'll try to work out what's floating with the voters and what's drowning. Joining me live from their living rooms, box rooms and bedrooms will be a sample of the electorate and in the studio this week, the Scottish National Party's Keith Brown and the Liberal Democrat peer Brian Paddock. They're joined by businesswoman and former Dragon Hilary DeVay and the author Tony Parsons. Brian, I'll, I'll begin with you. Just give me your abiding impression of, of the week's campaigning. It's been a strange one. Well, I think both major parties, the Tories and Labour, realise that neither of them are going to get an overall majority. So they're becoming increasingly desperate to try and make a seismic shift in the electorate. And it's not working, whether it's the Tories complaining, you know, scare stories about Labour and the SNP lurching over to the left, when, of course, they could just as easily lurch off to the right. And then Ed Miliband now... Um, using drowning uh, refugees as a weapon to try and beat David Cameron with. Keith Brown? I think that extraordinary uh, manifesto launched by Nicola Sturgeon, I know I'm biased, <laughs> but the fact that she was able to take any question from any journalist and exhausted all the questions that were asked, you know, uh, in a way that's not happened at the other party launches, I think that was something different in this campaign, as well as the very fact of the huge attendance uh, and the backdrop. I think one journalist tweeted saying, if Heineken did uh, manifesto launches, that's the way they would do it. <laughs> mm. Hilary DeVay. Um... I think the highlight of the week for me was um, John Major stating that we'd end up with a fragmented Britain. Coming out of hibernation to yeah, savage and the SNP. Clear divide. And I also think, for me, I've been in the States for three months, <clears throat> so I only came back this week. And really, it was like coming back to a different country. You know, it's like children in a playground where, you know, you've got the Tories saying, well, we will... Um, increase the tax threshold for inheritance tax to a million so you keep joining and say but we'll abolish it it's like a playground tony parsons are you on the swings or the slide i'm on the roundabout <laughs> um i think this week it's become clear that the election is going to be decided by the reluctant tories and we know about the shy tories because every poll since 1992 has underestimated the conservative support in very people don't like admitting that they're going to vote tories but i think in this general election, it's going to be completely decided by the number of reluctant Tories who vote for Cameron, although they think he's been a lousy Prime Minister. I mean, if you look at the combined Tory and UKIP vote, 
it's almost 50%. It's, it's and going up. It's bigger than 2010. And, and it's just a question of how many fruitcakes, loonies and closet racists can find it in their heart to say, I'm voting for the party, not the chinless man. Well, what an opportune moment to once again reveal our lethal weapon in the war against spin and evasion, the vote worm. First, we made a film of the best bits of the week's manifesto launches and electioneering. Next, we got 500 people, very carefully selected by the pollster's comrades, to watch it all and hit a thumbs up or a thumbs down button every single second. It all ends up creating this red line of weighted data that goes up and down according to the nation's button-based preferences. So let's have a look at this week's worm, which I can safely say yielded the most relentlessly negative, the most determinedly downbeat response we've yet seen from almost all of our Comrades 500. We'll focus in detail on the SNP and the Lib Dems later, but let's start with Nigel Farage discussing his preferred type of immigrants. I have to confess, I do have a slight preference. I do think, naturally, that people from India and Australia are in some ways more likely to speak English, understand common law and have a connection with this country uh, than some people that come perhaps from countries that haven't fully recovered from being behind the Iron Curtain. For whilst SNP support might put Mr Miliband in number 10, the payback for Labour will be very costly indeed. And if the SNP do win next year, they'll demand a further referendum on independence. We will exercise that influence responsibly and constructively, and we will always seek to exercise it in the interests of people, not just in Scotland, but across the whole of the UK. The manifesto we publish today sets out our priorities for progressive change. It is a manifesto above all else to end austerity. That will be our number one priority. The Labour Financial Secretary said on the Andrew Neil programme, he said famously, the Scottish Labour leader will not be writing uh, the Labour Party budget. But then I knew that already, because I'm writing the Labour Party budget. <laughs> Well, it's not very funny because it's potentially very serious. You could have a situation and it's a potential outcome of Ed Miliband in Downing Street propped up by the SNP and Alex Salmond with them effectively calling the shots, putting up the taxes, putting up the debt, putting up all the things that got us into trouble in the first place. That's not funny, that's very, very serious. And I think that is actually the right way to do it. And I think the British people deserve better than a inside the beltway discussion about permutations and hypotheticals and all that. A lot of people think the SNP calling the shots... That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. Everybody knows that neither David Cameron nor Ed Miliband will win a majority, even if they pretend otherwise. That's why it matters who holds the balance of power on the 8th of May. It could be Nigel Farage. It could be Alex Salmon, or it could be the Liberal Democrats. Keith Brown, uh, Mr Miliband says it ain't going to happen, but I'll tell you what, what has happened. The Conservative Party have turned the SNP into, well, the, the, the biggest weapon in their arsenal. How have they pulled that off? Doesn't seem to be doing the SNP any harm whatsoever in Scotland, but uh, obviously they're doing that for their own reasons, to try and herd UKIP voters back towards the Conservatives. Why, why would a UKIP voter come back to the Conservatives having been spooked by a Scot? That's the calculation that the Conservatives have made. You'd have to ask them for that. But what I would say is that last year we went through a referendum where we were told consistently by the Tories and Labour and the Lib Dems, look, stay with us. You can lead the UK. Now suddenly when the people in Scotland are looking like they want to vote for the SNP, oh no, that can't happen. It's not legitimate. And 
people in Scotland don't take that uh, seriously. They don't think it's a well, legitimate you, position. You mentioned the referendum. It was typified, some say, by negative campaigning. Frankly, when it comes to negative campaigning, it couldn't hold a candle to what we've seen this week, could it? <laughs> well, it is, and I think it turns people off this kind of negative campaigning. You saw Nicola Sturgeon's well, press... It's turning them off the there. SNP, south of the border, well, so not, why should you care? I don't think we're competing for votes uh, south of the border. We don't have any candidates south of the border. We're fighting a co positive campaign in Scotland, and that's been received very well. But you're right to contrast that with what's become an increasingly negative, bitter campaign down south. Brian Paddock, we should be talking about your lot, shouldn't we, when it comes to the balance of power? Mr Clegg looked almost forlorn there, mentioning the, 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 the two men who are more, well, the man and the woman, who are more routinely being cited as likely to be able to give the keys of Number 10 Downing Street to Cameron or Miliband. Well, the, the IFS decided that we were one of the four parties that needed their uh, books e be examined because the IFS thinks potentially the Liberal Democrats could be uh, in you know, coalition I haven't, I haven't again. Met a, I haven't met a politician for, for two months who hasn't cited the IFS as being on their side. Talk, talk to me a bit, if you no, would, what, instead, what, what about, I... about the negative campaigning, about the way this election now seems to be about who people are going to vote against instead of who they're going to vote for, and it's damaging the Liberal Democrats. No, all, all the only point that Nick Clegg is, trying to, is, is putting to the voters is what is absolutely obvious, that it's not just going to be Ed Miliband or David Cameron on their own walking through the doors of number 10. The, the electorate have got to think about who is going to walk through the door of number 10 with them. And all he That's is saying... That's how he's trying to scare people. Well, I don't know a bit about scaring people. It's, it's stating the obvious, because the polls show that neither of those two parties is going to have a majority, and therefore they will have to do a deal with somebody. And Nick Clegg is saying think about the, the voting for Liberal Democrats because that would be a better coalition than it would be with the other people. He, he goes a little bit further in tomorrow's Financial Times, only a little bit further than he's gone before, in ruling out any deal at all with the, with the Scottish National Party. W w why is that? Well, he's ruled out a deal with either the Scottish National Party because the Scottish, the Scottish National Party, and the clue is in the title, want to break up the United Kingdom. That's their in, in, you know, ultimate goal. And he's also... There's a clue in the title of the Liberal Democrats. They're also, Democrats, and, and people will express a vote north of the border. Your leader has already said that those, yeah, but, those but voters should be do, ignored. We, yeah, but the majority of people in Scotland want the union to stay together. That's what the result of the referendum is. So Nick Clegg isn't saying other, anything other than what the, peop, the majority of people in Scotland have been saying. But he's also ruled out a coalition with UKIP. So he's being even-handed in terms of not wanting to, to get into bed with extremists on either side. Extremists. He hasn't had a bad uh, election, actually, Clegg. I mean, after the European elections, he looked like a broken man. He really did look completely finished. And I think that they, they've started to... There was so much... You know, he, he, played the, he played Nicola Sturgeon five years ago. You know, he was the great shining star of the campaign. And there was so much disappointment in the... From not from the, the neutrals, but from the people that supported them and thought that they were going to aff affect real change. Um, I think he's, he really seemed like a broken man, like it was all over for him. And he, he actually seems quite, he's, he's, he seems quite buoyant, you know? Do you he see a resurgence? Of yes, I do. I think he's quite bullish. He's, I think he's, he was perhaps late out of the traps. Late out and of I the think, traps. And I think, hang on, Tony. I just, yeah. I, just want to, I just want to direct all of your attention towards um, someone who, who also perhaps has been late out of the traps, but is tearing around the track even faster than Nick Clegg. Um, this is how the English regions responded specifically to the contributions to the worm film we saw earlier featuring uh, Nicholas Sturgeon and Alex Salmond. You can see it's, it's, it's perhaps predictably grim in the north, in the Midlands, in the east of England and in the south. This, this campaign to weaponise the SNP is clearly working among Tories. Um, Victoria Tuck is, is a, a dyed-in-the-wool Tory. You're, we can see you there in Norfolk. What on earth is wrong with Nicola Sturgeon, Victoria? Well, she's very, very strong as a politician, and she comes across um, as this... She's going to dominate Miliband. She has this sort of domination about her and this determination, and she's putting her in Westminster would be like putting a scorpion in there. You don't know where it is, but it's got a sting in the tail. <laughs> and every time you want to negotiate with her, this woman's going to come along and sting someone for what she wants. I mean, the Scottish... Less than eight months ago, she was fighting for the breakup of the union for independence for Scotland. And now she's offering the hand of friendship. Well, so, uh, she seems to be... I, I, I'm going to offer the hand of friendship, if I may, to Maya Pachava, another sort of uh, loyal 
Tory and, and another one who is, is spooked by Salmond and Sturgeon Meyer. I do not favour SNP because their policies are geared towards Scotland and not for the greater good of Britain. If SNP was to form a coalition with any of the major political parties, not only would the government be held to ransom, but I believe it would result in a coalition of chaos. It would also lead to political fragmentation, economic instability, and social disruption amongst the population. A sting in the tail and a coalition of chaos. You don't care, do you, Keith Brown? Well, I do, but I think you have to think, just in recent history, we've had a situation in Scotland where we have one Conservative MP out of 59, and we've had a Conservative-led government during that time, and we're told to accept that because we're in the United Kingdom. Now, that's where we are. We're not proposing independence at this election. We're not saying that. It's not in a manifesto. And I think there are many people across the but UK it, it that is, would like to... Forgive me for interrupting. It is the raison d'etre of your entire well, political yeah. party. And we've never denied that. Yes. Nicholas Sturgeon's made that very explicit. But it's not on offer at this election. It's, there's no referendum that will derive from this election. But what is on offer is a change to the austerity promises. To hear Brian talk about the SNP as extremists when his party is responsible for the bedroom tax, for supporting nuclear weapons, I think that's pretty extreme. And I think many people across the rest of Britain, like in Scotland, are fed up with an austerity which has been much more felt by those at the lower end in terms of income and employment chances than it is at the upper end. So I think we have an offer that is attractive to many people across the UK. But of course, we are a Scottish party. We're not campaigning in these places. Yeah, I mean, but I think you're I... doing, hang on, uh, but Brian Paddock, you use the word extremist. In a way, Keith Brown has just described how, how the SNP are occupying territory that you should be. Well, I, I don't think that's the case at all. What, what, you know, what the IFS said was... Oh, not again. Was, was the, was, 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 was the Tell S me what you think. Was the SNP um, were going to have austerity for longer? just dragging it out. I mean, it's a bit like, OK, so everybody feels bad because they've had a, a big dose of austerity. What, what do you do if you feel bad? You go out and splurge on your credit card. Unfortunately, eventually you have to pay it back. And look at the interest rate that you're going to be charged but if you do that. And that's exactly what, that's what, exactly what the SNP the are proposing to do. It's not simply, a, you know, it's not just, um, you know, an end to austerity. It's extending austerity and handing the bill to our children and grandchildren. Yeah, your party has doubled the debt from £600 million to nearly £1.5 trillion. The idea that you can lecture other parties on fiscal rectitude when you've got a record which is absolutely appalling in terms of the debt and, we, and failed to reduce the deficit as well. So your party is the one that splurges on the credit card. All we are saying is that the yeah. poorest shouldn't pay the price for that. T Tony Parsons, um, yeah. why, why do you think everyone south of Hadrian's Wall appears to be so spooked by the Scottish Well, I, I think there's actually a degree of nat envy south of the border. As an Englishman, I, you know, I admire uh, Sturgeon and Salmond for the fire in the, their belly, for the way um, I know exactly what they think, and they're conviction politicians. I find it enormously... Are they extremists? I've, I, no, I don't think they are extremists. They're extremists in the sense that they put their own people first. You know, yeah, I'd love to they, see a few they, English politicians yeah. putting their own people first rather than apologising for their nationality. So um, I think that there's... Um, I, I do think it's, it's helping uh, the Tories. I do think that there's been a... Over the last week, there's been a degree of triumphalism about the SNP, about Nicola Sturgeon in particular, that it, as though it's in the bag already. Touch as though, the oh, yeah, also, as though, yeah, exactly that. As though, as though a Labour SNP coalition is, is a done deal. And I think we're actually a long way from that. And I yeah. certainly wouldn't put, put my money on that. But I do think that there's, um, although they would really admit it, there, there's a lot of people in the rest of the United Kingdom that admire the leaders of the SNP mm. for the way they put their own country first, they put their own people first, they're, they're politicians you, you know, with fire in their belly and you know exactly what they think. I don't know what Cameron but thinks it's, about it's, Europe, it's I don't know what he thinks well. about I mean, Libya. It, it's our country as well. Hilary Devey, are you one of these people that admires them and, and wishes there was an English um, equivalent? Yes, I admire them, but I certainly wouldn't want a government in coalition with Why not? them. Well, A, because the number one objective, the prime objective of the SNP is to have um, an independent Scotland, whether whether we debate this from now mm. or for the next 15 years, that is the case. Mm. And, you know, when Scotland was campaigning for independence, how many times did it did it arise in discussions with politicians that, you know, England actually supports each person per head 
in Scotland to the tune of, I don't know. Yeah, we just don't believe that. That's that's not the well, case. No, the last 30, it's, it's there, last 30 though, years, it? every year for the last 30 oh, years, look, Scotland's contributed I'll more in tax than it has have received no, back. No, I'm £90 sorry, billion pounds in terms of North Sea oil revenues. And the idea that Scotland is too poor, too wee to survive on its own, when you can just look to the north and see the example of Norway, a country the same well, size. Have you, speaking, have, speaking have, of have you had the referendum now? that the oil oh, is we're, diminished. Hang on, we're, we're struggling to deal with things that are actually happening rather than things <laughs> that might have done in an <laughs> alternative universe. Then it would have universe. been a different let, let, let me show you something that has happened this week. Um, it shows how different parties responded to Nicola Sturgeon's anti-austerity message, a, a message that perhaps um, English parties have failed to deliver quite so robustly. You can see that the Liberal Democrats, I mean, it, it never scales dizzy heights of approval, but they move um, up fairly noticeably when she shifts in that speech onto the issue of austerity. Um, Labour quite like it too. Uh, the anti-austerity message warms their uh, Labour Party hearts. And the Conservatives, oh, they hate absolutely everything. Yeah, more she's austerity. Ever, she's, she's, ever said, more she's, austerity. she's ever said or done. Let, let's go to Elvis and Wecky, who is that rarest of beasts, a Scottish Conservative Elvis, and uh, and <laughs> therefore, if I've read the worm correctly, you want more austerity, or at least as much as we've currently got. Well, um, I do think um, the uh, austerity measure we've got now is definitely growing our economy. Um, our economy is growing. More people are getting back into job. More household is getting more money into their pockets. Uh, I don't think we could necessarily say that this austerity hasn't benefited us all. However. Uh, Oh, Elvis, um, that's terrible. It would be Elvis, wouldn't it, that really? we have sound problems with. I'm just, I, I, what I'll BBC do... BBC always does this, you know. <laughs> when there's a Tory speaking, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly there's a fault with the electricity. I'll try and get Elvis a, back into oh, the building God, as quickly as possible. I want, to go to, so I, want to go to Mari, I want to go to Mari Gray next. Uh, if, if this was Blue Peter, Mari, you would be the guest that I prepared earlier because you are a former Liberal Democrat. Um, you've migrated over to the SNP. How did that anti-austerity... Um, contribution from Nicola Serge and play with you? Oh, it resonated 100%. Uh, from my perspective, um, she was just confirming what we all know, that the food banks are the legacy of the failed austerity policies. Um, and it's the poorest in our society that are suffering. And it's not just in Scotland. Um, the, the largest number of food banks are actually in, in London, 112 food banks in London. And, you know, history tells us that poverty limits and retards the life chances of our children. And I think every, well, every uh, millionaire who has ever set foot inside Westminster really ought to come out of that ivory tower for a few minutes and have a reality check. Well, Nicola well, Sturgeon... That, that's, that, thank you, Maury. That, that's a former Liberal Democrat. Um, that, that, that must trouble you. Yeah, she doesn't I, think you speak for her. What... You know, and I'm very concerned about the way that the sanctions work against people who don't turn up for their job interviews. Well, just, just confine so yourself to what Mari is concerned about, which is a sense that the Liberal Democrats aren't sticking up for the poorer people, the most vulnerable, well, those suffering what, the most from austerity. So what we're saying is that we only, we are, yes, there need to be cuts for the next two years, and then after that we, we will increase public spending. Mm. So only two more years of austerity left, necessary cuts to get the books into balance and then we will increase public expenditure whereas the Tories just want to cut 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 and the Labour they can't say when austerity is going to finish because they haven't set a date for balancing the books. Keith Brown are the Liberal Democrats I mentioned the, the Conservatives Scottish Conservatives are rare are the Liberal Democrats going to be extinct in Scotland? Well we had a, a penguin that beat the Liberal Democrats in the elections in 2012 um, in a recent by-election in Glenrothes they got one percent in the polls and I think uh, Nick Clegg's statements in the Financial Times, uh, you know, for the 11 remaining uh, Lib Dem MPs who are in a lot of trouble anyway, they'll see this and just cringe because this confirms Nick Clegg wants to deal with the Conservatives and he's cut the legs from the remaining Lib Dem MPs because this just confirms they're part of austerity, they're more comfortable with the Conservatives and as Mary quite rightly says, food banks right across Scotland, right across the UK, that's a legacy of the Lib Dems and the last thing they needed in Scotland, the few that are left, are to hear what Nick Clegg's got to say Nick, tomorrow. Nick Clegg quite clearly is uncomfortable with the SNP. He's not uncomfortable with Labour. 
Uh, Hilary DeVay, let's move to the other end of the economic scale, away from the sort of people who use food banks and, and towards uh, business people like you. Who, who troubles you more? Would it be um, a coalition with the SNP, probably with the Labour Party, or, 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 or a UKIP coalition with, um, or at least a contribution well, to a majority? Well, from a business perspective, yes. and I know an awful lot of my colleagues and counterpart feel the same way, I think a coalition of Conservative and Lib Dem would satisfy um, Why? a business criteria. Purely because, you know, I, I, you've got a lot of parties saying let's cease austerity but surely we've had that with every successive Labour government we've picked up the pieces after they've had spend 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 and now here's the bad news folks you've had it good for five years now I'm terribly sorry but you're going to have it really bad for the next 15 years because we've now got to pay the debt back. I'm just going to go to Brendan Clapp. Brendan, I, I, if you're still with us. Um, yeah, okay. uh, Tony Parsons <laughs> began this evening's programme by saying this election will hinge upon um, Tories who've migrated to UKIP coming back. You are a Tory. You have migrated to UKIP. Will, yeah. you, will you come back to help out David Cameron? Um, I don't think I will, no. Um, I certainly don't want Labour or the SNP to uh, get into government, but I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to acqu acquiesce to... Um, David Cameron, George Osborne's like tactics in terms of voting for somebody else and waking up with um, Ed Miliband, for example, um, or the SNP. Um, down here in Portsmouth, there's, um, well, Peter Vigors was recently called out for putting a duck house in his moat in his back garden. Um, Mike Hancock, the was the, uh, until he was suspended by the Liberal Democrats, the uh, sitting par parliamentary um, MP uh, in, my, in my region. I think we're just fed up with mainstream political parties at the moment, and it's time for change. I think recall is a superb initiative by UKIP. Um, and if the Tories really do want us to come back, I think what they should do is tweak their policy so that us closet racists and fruitcakes do go back to the party, rather than arrogantly sitting and waiting for us to join them. If they really care about this country, they'll do that. Tony Parsons, you're singing from, from an almost identical hymn sheet. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's possible that, um, you know, we might need five years of a socialist paradise before the right is united again. And I think that um, sooner or later Cameron will get out of the way um, for Boris Johnson, who can, I think, bring back Bring back um, people like Brendan. To, yeah, exactly. Oh, and um, but you know, but we I... might need five years of a socialist paradise before then. You know, just to, for for Ed for Ed to do exactly what he promises, which is do to Britain what Hollande has done to France. I mean, that's what he says, and I actually believe that he means it, and I think he'll do it. Yeah. We shall see. Um, Keith Brown, it's been a remarkable week, uh, particularly for the SNP. But this this notion of of coalition. It, we're nearing the end of the programme now, so you don't have to be as um, loyal to the party as you were at the <laughs> outset. What, what does the SNP really, really want to happen in England? Well, we don't want a coalition. I mean, that's just to go back to the no, point. I didn't ask what don't you want. Well, you did what, mention coalition what do when you, you spoke, want? though, and I just, it's worth making it clear we don't want a coalition with the Labour Party. <laughs> But what we'd like to see, I think, is something that reflects our own, our, our own values in terms of the anti-austerity. We've had a failed attempt to try and get austerity. I mean, Hillary mentions uh, the Tories and Lib Dems uh, being good for business. They've doubled the national debt. They've gone £90 billion over the projections for the, the deficit. So I don't think it is good for business. In Scotland, we've balanced our budget every single year. So I think I'd like to see those values. I, I'd be pleased if, in the rest of the UK, the values that we'd want to deal with but food banks and austerity. You've got five million people. We do indeed. Five point three. Same, yeah. same population as Norway. Yeah. A very wealthy country. Which has got it's got I think seven hundred million, uh, seven hundred billion pounds in reserves. The UK is one point five trillion pounds because in debt. Because most one of, of that the most has been paid by the British the taxpayer. In Norway, there's British taxpayers no, in, in um, Scotland as well. Scotland. I just want to push you a little further, if I may, on, on what you want the result of the election to be. For, for the SNP's very reason for existing, which is an independent Scotland, what will bring that about quicker? Uh, a Tory majority coalition or a Labour majority coalition? Well, just, I'm sorry to repeat the point. Independence is not per, for option in this election. So what we want to see happen in this election, what I'd like to see as the outcome is things which reflect the values which the SNP has. So that's a, an attack on austerity, an ending so to So you want Labour to win? Well, we want, well there's, there's other parties... And yet you're the weapon we that's... that's that surely burying Labour is not a bad, you know, not a bad result for the SNP well, it's in funny Scotland. Well, the Tories will say that we want 
want uh, Labour to win and vice versa. I'd like to see, for example, progressive parties like Plaid Cymru and the Greens to some extent doing well because that would present the chance for a progressive alliance right across the whole well, of the Paddy, UK. Paddy, you used to be the progressive party. What's happened? Well, we have shown in government that we are the progressive party. We're the ones who increase the personal allowance. We're the ones who introduce the pupil premium. Uh, we are the ones who introduce free school meals uh, for, for, uh, for infant school children. I mean, we have done so much to help. Well, we put the triple lock on pensions for which old half, age pensions. Which half of your support do you think you've lost? The half on the left or the half on the right? Well, there, are some, there, are, there were some last time, there were some Labour supporters who voted... Uh, Lib Dem, who were very disappointed that we went into coalition with the Conservatives. But we had to do that to get a stable government in order to rescue the economy. And the economy, so isn't, the out on the the, the economy isn't out of the woods yet. Oh, we need a stable government again. And so what we would see as an, a, a good result for the country, not just for the Liberal Democrats, is for either Labour or the Tories to have, plus the Liberal Democrats, to have a workable majority. That is, alas, all we've got time for. I, I, I can sense uh, we all feel like we've barely got started. Yeah. Um, but that's it for this week. My thanks to all my guests. There'll be more worms next week when it's the Conservative Party's turn in the comfy chair. Until then, good night. Hello.